Uh, thank you very much for having us here. Um, I'm Eli Ben Sasson. I'm co-founder and chief scientist in the East of uh, Starkware. I'm also joined here by uh, my co-founder and chief scientist in the West, Alessandro Chiesa, who will also be speaking later today, and also by our head of algebra research in R&D, Leo Goldberg, who will share the talk with me. So thanks a lot for having us here. Um, a little bit about uh, Starkware. Um, we are a team of more than 25 members. We're growing. Most of us are engineers. Um, we raised uh, 40 million in funding, including from the Electric Coin Company. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the alpha product that we just released on an Ethereum testnet. Um, we're also working on a project that will recommend and also build Stark provers and verifiers for very efficient Stark friendly hashes. This is a project that uh, was given to us by the Ethereum Foundation. And um, we'll be holding the Starkware sessions in September, right after Scaling Bitcoin, where we'll uh, teach how to build Starks and tell you a little bit more um, um, what we're doing with them. So um, I guess most of the crowd here knows that you can use uh, zero knowledge proofs also for solving scalability because they come with exponentially small proof sizes and the verification time for verifying a proof is also exponentially small compared to the payload or the number of transactions or whatnot that you wanna uh, ass assert uh, integrity of. The prover is quite efficient as well uh, in, in you know, the number of transactions that you're dealing with and you can apply them to any computation that you can define by some program and if you have a ZKP system that also is transparent, meaning it, it doesn't require any trusted setup, then what you have is a ZK Stark. Um, the ZK Starks that we build happen to also have very lean cryptography, uh, which makes them a little bit more secure and also faster to uh, both prove and verify than other technologies. So let's look a little bit about on the t uh, blockchain scalability problem. Basically what we want to do is uh, Were all the slides not shown or just disappeared now? Ah, okay. I can start singing or something. You know. Here. Okay, good. So, uh, yeah, no problem. So the blockchain scalability problem is that what we would like to do, wait, you saw these things? Well, this was the previous one. Okay, good. So the blockchain scalability um, challenge is that we would like to push the network throughput constantly to the uh, to your right. Good. Um, it's also my right on this laptop. Um, which also means that as all the nodes are checking all the transactions, uh, they proportionally increase their computation time. Now, at our disposal in the world, we have pretty large compute power, so you could, like every two years, let's say, increase the throughput of Bitcoin or Zcash by 10x. There are computers that probably would, would deal with it, but you would lose a lot of, you know, just uh, common folks who want to follow the network and, and help check it, that, that everything is valid. So because of that, um, in all blockchains, the permissionless ones, the block size is limited to, uh, hmm. the block size is limited to let's say, you know, small, uh, uh, 
small you know, computation power. And uh, because of that, you sort of have a limit to how, much, uh, how many transactions you can put uh, on, the, on the chain at a given point in time. Did I take this out and bring it in again? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, they are public. But, uh. Yes. Yeah, uh, I'll repeat the question. Are, are there any plans to release, uh, you know, DSLs in high-level languages and so on? So definitely it's in the plan, um, but it will take some time. Um, the way we're doing it is, you know, first we're hand-optimizing a bunch of stuff, um, but over time that's, that's where we're heading towards, definitely. Sorry? Um, I, I, oh, it's kind of long. I can share it with you if it helps. Okay, good. So, uh, okay. So, uh, so we were here. So we would like to push the, uh, you know, the throughput to the your right, but blockchains, for good reasons, limit the amount of computation that you can do on chain, so that everyone with their laptops, when they're able to connect, can check what's going on. So um, this is how scalability plays in, because any scalable proof system has this property that the verified time, which is the orange thing. Uh, grows, or I guess the deep orange thing, grows at a, an exponentially faster rate than the proving time, which grows only slightly more than the naive computation, and because of that you can uh, scale things better. So there are a bunch of other ZKP systems out there, and, and I'd like to claim that for scalability ZK starts outshine. So for instance, uh, Bulletproof is a very good um, privacy technology. Um, but its verifier time scales linearly with the amount of computation. Uh, SNARKs, that everyone here is familiar with, has a trusted setup, so it's not transparent, and this tr setup sort of scales linearly with the size of the basic computation that you want to achieve. Um, recursive SNARKs have a trusted setup. That setup is much shorter and doesn't scale uh, linearly with the amount of computation, but you pay for that with prover time and complexity. Um, so here's another way to sort of look at the different systems um, and compare them. Uh, famously, ZK Starks have longer proofs than the other systems that I was just talking about. For a single shielded transaction, we brought it down to about 20 kilobytes, but it's still uh, two orders of magnitude uh, larger than, than a SNARK and one order of magnitude larger than, than a bulletproof for a similar computation. Um, ZK Starks are transparent, as is Bulletproofs. Um, ZK Starks, among these ones surveyed, are the only ones who are plausibly post-quantum secure. Um, all of these, but for Bulletproofs, have exponential verifier speed up. So these are things that you know, have been already posted and discussed. I want to point out two more things that are quite relevant. The first is that when you construct ZK Starks, you can use any finite field that you want. And this has a huge impact on, first of all, the ability to express different things because different uh, computations are more efficient over certain fields. For instance, if you'd like to talk about something like AES, then you're better off using binary fields, uh, which is much harder to do with uh, SNARK or bulletproofs. Uh, you can use, for instance, primes that are very efficient to do arith arithmetic on. For instance, the representation has a very large number of bytes that are all zeros. Uh, you don't have this uh, sort of constraint in selecting 
the prime that you're using, and you can also work with extensions of small primes and stuff like that. Uh, the other systems require a lot of number theoretic assumptions and constructions, and these constrain the uh, kind of uh, fields, finite fields that you work with. Usually these be, will be very large prime fields, and they also have additional requirements that are that emerge from using elliptic curve cryptography. So all of this does not appear at all at the start. Okay, possibly. Um, point taken. Another thing is that when you write constraints, you have more flexibility because you don't need it necessarily, you don't need it necessarily to be a degree two R1CS constraint, it could be any constraint. Um, this gives you a little bit more flexibility. So um, what we did with these things, so as we said, we have 25 uh, people, most of them engineers, and we're building stuff very robustly. Uh, this would be the picture if you look at amortized cost per transaction, if you're batching many things together. So it will go down to zero quite fast. And indeed, this is an example of this. If you take uh, many trades over Ethereum ERC-20 token pairs and you batch them together, so this would be the amortized, amortized gas cost and these are not uh, you know, abstract theoretical numbers, these are actually things that we uh, did and uh, implemented. So in a batch of 8,000 trades, uh, the amortized gas cost is under 1,000 gas per trade. If you try to settle on-chain directly, it would be around 100 to 200,000 gas, so it's a 200x improvement. And uh, the Starkdex uh, alpha that I mentioned actually gives you, um, you know, 6,000 gas per trade, which is 20 times uh, better than uh, would be if you used uh, it over Ethereum the usual way. So this is a system that we've been running on a testnet for many weeks and uh, constantly taking a live feed from Binance. Um, we settled more than 10 million trades. Uh, the average latency for generating a proof is 10 minutes. Um, each one of these proofs asserts uh, about 260,000 Peterson hashes, so quite large, and if, uh, for 8,000 batches, it's eight, eight times larger than this number, uh, around uh, four uh, million Peterson hashes, and uh, that's a system that we built. So where we're heading with this thing is uh, we'd like to get as many decentralized with direct exchanges and as many centralized exchanges to work with us, and uh, Coinbase already announced that they're uh, working with us on, on getting non-custodial trading to their uh, uh, users. And um, there's something uh, popping up on that thing. Okay. So, and now I want to hand it over to Elio Goldberg, our head of R&D, who will tell you a little bit of how we go about building these things and the improvements that we're making. Hi. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to talk about a few things. Uh, first, the process of designing ERs, and ER stands for Algebraic Intermediate Representation. Uh, basically, it's the stack equivalent of an R1CS, or an arithmetic circuit. And the main difference between the two is that um, R1CS represents an unfolded version of the computation, while an ER represents a computation in a succinct way. Uh, basically, what you have in an ER is a table of field elements, and polynomial constraints on, the, on these elements that state how you move from one state to another. Um, I'm going to talk, talk, to talk about uh, recent scientific developments uh, in the Stark protocol and what's next in our pipeline. Okay, so the fact that an air is succinct has many important advantages, such as scalability and the ability to work with high degree polynomial. Um, but the process of designing an air is more complicated because you have an additional step of uh, placement. You have to decide how to arrange the field elements in a table. Okay, so the way we approach this problem um, in order to make designing as an easy task is to build an infrastructure of tools. So our engineers uh, has to have to um, write a description of the air in Python and from this, uh, using our tools, we automatically get a few things. So uh, we have a tool that takes the, this, this Pythonic description and creates an efficient auto-generated solidity code. Um, this code is 
the actual code that runs in the Starkdex alpha verifier. Um, another tool generates C++ code from this Pythonic description. And this code is used in our provers. We have a testing framework uh, which allows us to write tests in Python uh, for the air. And finally, a visualization utility that allows us both to uh, debug the air and add new features. Okay, so I wanted to show you a demo of the, uh, of the visualization utility, but we have technical problems. Uh, so this is a screenshot. Uh, what you see here is an error for the Peterson hash function. Uh, in Peterson, you have to s compute the sum of points on the elliptic curve. So uh, basically what you see is a table of, uh, of, of the field elements. You don't see obviously the, the field elements, but you see the constraints on the table. So for example, when the mouse overs this constraint, um, I'll try to, try to use the laser, uh, this constraint here, uh, says that this cell is the slope between two points, EC and FD, uh, which is necessary for the computation of uh, summation on at the elliptic curve, uh, conditioned on whether we actually want to add the two points. By the way, this is a degree two constraint. Okay, and now for uh, uh, to a completely different topic. Um, uh, in Starkware, we are not only designing Air Force specific products, we are also working on trying to improve uh, the Stark protocol itself. Uh, so this is such an example. It's called Deep Stark. The name uh, Deep Stark came from the fact that we had a protocol called Fry. So a natural name for an improvement of Fry uh, was Deep Fry. And since the, since the Deep technique also applies to Stark, so we get also Deep Stark. Um, I'm not going to go into all the details of Deep Fry and Deep Stark. You can see uh, the details in the paper. Uh, but I will tell you one place where uh, deep, the Deep technique applies to Stark. Uh, so you may be familiar with this equation. Um, it appears in SNARK. Um, basically, you end up with a few polynomials of relatively high degree, and you have to check the equality there. And we have similar equations in Starks and other proof systems. Um, now, the way you approach it in, in SNARK is that during the trusted setup, we pick a, a random field element tau and encrypt it, and then we use tau in order to check uh, the equality. And let's say that we want uh, 128 bit of security and that the field is larger than, larger than uh, 2 to the 128. So one sample of tau is enough for the test, which is great. Uh, in, in Stark, we have a different situation. Um, basically, tau is chosen during the, the, uh, the proof generation. Not, we don't have trusted setup, and it's not encrypted. And instead, we have commitments to the values a of x, b of x, and so on for x in a small domain. So originally in Stark, what we did, would, we did was to pick uh, tau from this smaller domain. And the fact that tau was chosen from a smaller domain and not from the entire field uh, meant that you had to pick many samples of tau in order to get the required, required level of security. Now what we are doing in deep Stark is we pick tau from the entire uh, field and then the prover sends the value A of tau and B of tau and so on. Now, the verifier can directly check that these are the correct values because the prover did not commit to A of tau and so on. It committed only to A of x for x in the smaller domain. Uh, but this is exactly the place where the deep te technique helps. It allows, us, it allows the prover to convince the verifier that the value of A of tau is correct given uh, the values of A of x for x in the smaller domain. And this brings us back to uh, having to sample only one tau, which reduces the, the proof length. By the way, uh, deep Stark is already implemented in the Starkdex alpha. Okay, so what's next? Uh, interactivity. So what we are doing currently is we take the 
interactive start protocol and applied the, the PHM heuristic in order to get a non-interactive proof. Um, we added a step of uh, proof of work in order to reduce the number of queries that we need in the FRI protocol. So uh, let's say that we are doing something between 30 to 40 bits uh, of proof of work. This reduces the number of queries. What we can do is get randomness from the blockchain. And this is more or less equivalent to doing Fiat with proof of work, except that uh, this allows us to be in, in the range of 50 to 70 bits of security instead of 30 to 40, which will further reduce the proof length. Uh, we've got a sizable grant from the Ethereum Foundation, and as part of this grant, we are looking for Stark-friendly hash functions. Um, we are basically, this means that we, we need a hash function that is, is both uh, secure and with a small error. We're working with a few teams uh, that suggest such functions, and imagine that like Peterson has, uh, the Peterson Air has around 1,000 cells, and such a, a stock friendly hash function um, can be something like 100 cells. So this can be a, a great improvement to the proof at time. And finally, extension fields. So um, currently we're working with the GFP for P256 uh, uh, bit number. What we can do is move to, to GFQ to the fourth, where Q is 64 bit number, get the same level of security, but with a better uh, proof, uh, proof, proof of time and also shorter proof. Um, and if you are interested to hear more about these kind of things, uh, then you're welcome to the Stackware session in September. Thank you. So I think we have time for questions. Thanks for the awesome presentations. Really exciting work you guys are doing. Uh, quick question, why did you guys choose to implement uh, the exchange, the Stark Dex, as your first proof of concept, like live proof of concept? Great question. So um, I guess the, the, the things that, uh, you know, we were looking at a number of different options, among them, you know, privacy over Ethereum, uh, scalability just of payments over Ethereum, and this thing. Um, and we consulted with a lot of uh, groups. The main uh, benefit of doing this thing is that it addresses uh, a real problem that occurs today and that we can pretty much do it, uh, I would say alone, though of course in this project uh, this was a joint work with uh, Zero X, but let's say compared to L1 uh, uh, things, we didn't need you know, the coordination problem of, of uh, you know, getting the approval of a community, we can just go at it uh, and that's, so that's roughly the reason. But it's. It's not the end point or it's not that, uh, you know, this is the first thing we want to do. We want to do a lot more. Um, you said you were considering um, uh, extension fields, degree four extension fields. There's no discrete log assumption on that field. Is that right? We don't need any, uh, any okay. number theoretic assumption. Right, so, so it's just which field is uh, most efficient to implement on the platform. Yes, using yes. The prover. yes. Okay, thanks. So uh, deep fry sounds like a really nice uh, breakthrough. Uh, uh, is, how does it compare in terms of needing uh, some assumptions about Reed Solomon codes? Does it also improve on that? Uh, uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, deep fry uh, has better soundness guarantees than fry. Uh, also, like uncon just with the random oracle model, like no other. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So okay. First of all, it has a, a provable higher soundness, which actually is tight for very pathological cases. And uh, it's, you know, strongest uh, soundness conjecture, which matches the upper bounds, is actually uh, reducible, sorry, is implied by uh, a well-known set of conjectures about the list decodability of uh, Reed Solomon. So if Reed Solomon's list decodable up to capacity, which is plausible, uh, then uh, deep fry soundness is basically the distance all the way up to capacity, which is optimal. And the, and the actual soundness depends on the list decodability radius? Is there like a one-to-one? -one, uh... Not in both directions. So even if list decoding um, bound
ones are worse. It doesn't so it's a sufficient condition, not a necessary one. Thanks. Oh, thanks for the talk. Um, so uh, I guess I, I'm curious if you have, uh, you know, I, I see that you're using, uh, you know, that you have some Python libraries or, or whatever for generating the errors. Um, do you, have you come up with, you know, one thing that's complicated with, with Starks uh, programming them is like phrasing your computation in like this very loopy way, right? Um, uh, do you have good abstractions for uh, making, you know, these kind of loops inside of loops uh, nice to write? And um, is there anywhere something written about it, if, if so? Um, so yes, we have some abstractions. Mm -hmm. And no, I don't think that we uh, published it yet. Well, the, there's the older stuff, like uh, there's a, an MST thesis by Eugenia Pergament that shows how you convert, you know, tiny RAM code into it. But, you know, we've progressed a lot more since then and do things much more efficiently. Um, we're, we're, you know, going to be releasing more and more information as it sort of matures and we understand it better. But uh, under blog posts that we're writing and the Starcore sessions will be going a lot more into details. Thank you very much for the talk. Um, Eli, you mentioned at the beginning of the talk that uh, essentially Starks can use any kind of constraint system compared to others that use like R1CS, for example. Yeah. Uh, and I understand that's a possibility, like also when you look at Aurora that is based on R1CS and so on, but if I get it right, then you're losing, when you, lose, when you use R1CS on Starks, you lose this kind of uniformity property that, that takes advantage of loop structure. Uh, and if that's correct, then do you have any idea of how to map like air to R1CS or vice versa? Is this something that you're looking into? So in Aurora you have uh, for in Aurora you have uh, also a succinct uh, version of an R1CS because you have an R1CS uh, that repeats itself. Um, so basically, um, you can imagine an, an axis in which. In one place, you have R1CS, which is the unfolded, fully unfolded version. In the middle, you have Aurora, which is somewhere in the middle. And you have Stark, which is uh, the fully succinct version. Uh, so this, this is just uh, like. Just to add to that. On the apl application. Uh, just to add to that, just like you can take a program and unroll it into a circuit, you can easily take an air and the length of a computation and unroll it and generate R1CS for that thing. Um, another thing that I think uh, Leo was also referring to, so there's a paper that we submitted jointly, two of us, with Alessandro and many of his uh, um, students and, and, and postdocs and coworkers that um, addresses exactly this point of how, suppose you have uh, a representation of just one step through R1CS, but it's gonna be rolled up out many times. There's a way to do it succinctly. And this paper has been submitted and uh, 